Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to say that um, I am really, really, one, um, honored and privileged uh, to be here. And I, I did not realize until I got here and actually saw the program what an incredible conference this is. Um, this is just, this is really, truly one of the most amazing lineups uh, and programs uh, I, I've ever seen uh, dealing with uh, plant-based nutrition and issues. And um, I, I just, by way of transparency, should tell you guys, I, I, I'm definitely uh, a Christian and I take a lot of my life's lessons uh, from the Bible. And I'm thinking of uh, when Jesus uh, met the woman at the well and they sat down and had a, a talk and when he was finally able to convince her that he was, in fact, the Messiah, she went and brought everybody in the town back to meet him. And I think tonight, you guys need to go home and drag everybody you know back to this conference. I mean, pull a gun on them if you have to. If you look at the lineup, of speakers that they have, if you guys had to pay for this, this would be five to $10,000. But it's absolutely free. And I'm telling you, don't miss out on this blessing. Don't let your loved ones miss out on this blessing. So having said that, what am I gonna to talk to you guys about today? I am going to talk about the why of being plant-based. Now, I, I am uh, uh, honored to say that it is an honor and a privilege to follow Brenda Davis because she does some, some of the most incredible, amazing, complete, and accessible uh, lectures on the uh, value and benefits of being plant-based for our health. And over the course of these 10 days, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to talk to you about how being plant-based is better for you health-wise, how it's better for the environment, but that still leaves the question of why. Why is it that being plant-based is better for us? Because I'm sure that you, like me, when you were uh, in school, you were taught that human beings are omnivores, meaning that we are supposed to be eating a mixture of animal and plant foods. And if that's true, then why is it that eliminating part of what we're supposed to be eating is better for us? Well, it's because like Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca, we've been misinformed. Uh, we are not omnivores. We are by design and physiology and even our psychology strict plant eaters, and that's what I hope to prove to you today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started, and I'll start you off with a quote of mine. People have been so thoroughly brainwashed that they actually think eating pieces of dead, rotting corpses is somehow healthy. It's just crazy. It's a corpse, ladies and gentlemen. It may not be in a casket, but it's a corpse. So again, title of the talk, Are Humans Designed to Eat Meat? I started all my lectures off with a quote from God's word. This is from the book of Genesis. He says, you shall eat the plants of the field. So why is this topic important? It's important because experts estimate that up to 80% of the major disease and premature death that we see in Western countries every year could be prevented by making major changes in our diet and lifestyle. And again, just think about that for a moment, 80%. If I were to ask to sh for a show of hands, which I really can't see because the lights are in my eyes, but if I were to ask you to raise your hands if you know of someone who's had a heart attack or had cancer or has diabetes or who has died from these dise diseases, I'm willing to bet every single hand in this room would go up. And I'm sure uh, many of you, like me, have lost loved ones before their time to these dreadful diseases. Well, if you think that 
80% of those people or 80% of the suffering that they've endured could have been avoided, that is just a really sobering statistic. And so we need to understand that, yes, being plant-based will help us avoid these things, but we also need to understand why. And it's also important to understand why because it puts greater impetus and a, a greater moral underpinning on the need to change our diets. Now, we've been told we need to change our diets for our health. Uh, Brenda mentioned how important it is to save the earth. Lots of people are talking to you about the, uh, um, the impact of animal-based agriculture on uh, climate change and global warming. It is the number one driver of climate change and global warming, which is why I tell people all the time, if you drive a Prius and still eat meat, you need more fiber in your diet. <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. Um, and, uh, and so the question is, why is that true? Well, it's true because we are plant eaters, but when you understand that we are plant eaters, then it means it is completely immoral for us to be killing animals and destroying our planet when we shouldn't be doing that in the first place. You know, it's one thing if we're supposed to be doing it, but we say, you know what, that's causing problems, so I'm gonna change because it's better for everybody. That's like, you know, let's say you're, you're, you're having a party and it's 11 o'clock at night and your neighbor comes over and says, hey, you're keeping me up. And you say, okay, well, you know what? It's my house, I have a right to have a party, but since it's disturbing you, I'm going to shut the music off. No, this is not it. This is a case where the city ordinance says no parties, <laughs> okay? So we should not be eating animals in the first place, which means that killing, raising animals for human consumption and destroying the earth to do it is completely unjustifiable and immoral. So how are we going to figure that out? How do you figure out what uh, a particular animal should be eating? Well, first of all, it's very clear that animals that are designed to eat stuff that looks like this clearly have different issues from animals that are designed to look to eat things that look like these two antelope over here. Why? Because plants are anchored into the ground. They don't get up and run away. They also don't kick you or try to stab you with antlers. Um, and uh, they're generally rather docile. But they also tend to be spread out over a vast area. And depending on the climate patterns, they may be in season in one area, but then as the rains move, they, be, they become available in a different area. So if you're designed to eat plants, you've got to cover a lot of territory to find the food you eat. Now animals, on the other hand, they aren't anchored in the ground. They tend to react negatively when you bite them. <laughs> and so. If you are a creature that is designed to eat other animals, you have to be capable of, number one, chasing them down, catching them, and then essentially killing them and dismembering them without becoming injured yourself and disabled yourself. And so how do animals do that? Well, we see that carnivores are optimized for predation. They are optimized for chasing animals down bringing them down in an efficient fa fashion, killing them without becoming injured. Herbivores, on the other hand, are designed for foraging. That is covering large amounts of territory at a low energy cost. And why am I bringing up the topic of energy? You see the title of this slide is Metrics, Feeding Strategies and Energy Efficiency. It's because all animals must procure their food in an energy efficient fashion. That sounds obvious, but think about it. Why is that important? Because if you expend more energy acquiring the food that you eat than you can extract from that, in, from that food, what happens to you? 
I, I heard mumbling, but I didn't hear an answer. I, I excuse me. Let, let me. let me make it clear. This is an interactive uh, lecture. I expect audience responses when I ask a question, and if I don't get them, I'm going to start pointing out people, okay? <laughs> so, so, what happens if you expend more energy on the food that you can extract from the food once you get it? You have you ha right, you have an energy deficiency and you starve to death. So that's not a viable strategy for survival. And for that reason, carnivores do not go out and look for the biggest, strongest animal on the savanna. Because that's the animal that's likely to kill them or to injure them so severely that they will not be able to hunt. So instead, they look for weak, diseased, or animals that are defective in some way, that are stupid, maybe they're wearing a MAGA hat, I don't know. Um, because those animals are easier to catch. And therefore, they will expend less energy catching those animals than, and, uh, than they, uh, uh, or they will be able to extract more energy from those animals than they had to expend catching them. Herbivores, by contrast, do not want the plant food that is dried out, brown, brittle, and essentially, uh, uh, falling apart. Why? Because there's no nutrient, nutritive value to those plants. Those plants have lost all of their nutri nutrition. So instead, I'm sorry? Uh, <laughs> um, termites uh, do survive on cellulose, but termites are insects and we are focusing on mammals. And now, I mean, now it's important because insects have completely different physiology from mammals. And, um, and because of uh, termites have uh, specialized bacteria that allow them to process um, uh, 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 wood fiber and extract energy from that. But again, we don't have the physiology of termites, so that doesn't, and, and no mammal has the physiology of a termite, so we really can't look at termites as an example of what we should be eating. Um, so, I beg your pardon? Uh, termites look for wood. I mean, they, they look for cellulose. But again, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys want to debate the, the you know, whys and wherefores of insects, we can do that after this lecture. This lecture is going to look at mammals because we are a mammal. So let's stay within the housing of this lecture, because it's kind of silly to try and compare ourselves to insects. So herbivores, by contrast, seek the most lush, verdant, and newest, healthiest uh, foliage because it is the most nutrient dense. Predation using, and this is key, I want you guys to think about this. Predation using an herbivore mentality is environmentally destructive. What do I mean by that? So, Carnivores look for, you know, dead, dying, weak, diseased food. The herbivores look for the most fresh, lush, new, verdant food. So if you have that mindset of a plant eater and you want the biggest, the best, the prettiest, the most lush, and you go out and you prey on a species and you start taking out the biggest, most beautiful, most robust animals in that species, what are you going to do to it? You're going to drive those animals to extinction because you're removing the best genes from the gene pool. It's completely bass backwards. The carnivores, on the other hand, are actually strengthening the gene pool because they're removing the defective genes. And this brings up what I call the beauty paradigm and species destruction. Species survival in, in nature is, again, as we already discussed, fundamentally, a question of energy out versus energy in. You expend more energy than you can uh, get from your food, you die. And so all true predators, again, seek what can be thought of as ugly food. They don't waste their time chasing healthy animals because they're not likely to catch those animals, or if they do, they're likely to be injured by them, and that means that they won't be able to hunt. So they look for sick, diseased, or an, uh, very young animals, animals that are lame, um, and, uh, or something that is already dead. And that means that they're weeding out the less fit genes, they're strengthening the gene pools, 
By contrast, again, the plant eaters look for the most lush, the most beautiful food because it is the most nutritious. And when we, because of our herbivore mindset, remove the best genes from animal species, we do what we have done historically, we drive animal species to extinction. Now, and you contrast that with when you eat the, the healthiest and most lush plants, you swallow their seeds, you walk a couple miles down the road, you take a poop, and you deposit those seeds with some fertilizer, and you help spread those plants throughout the environment. It's a beautiful system when it works the way it's supposed to. So let's look at some carnivores. Well, the first thing you notice is that they have a very uh, streamlined shape. Uh, they're kind of shaped like a torpedo so that when they're run, they present the smallest cross-section cross of their body to the wind so that when they're running, they don't encounter a lot of wind resistance and that helps them run very fast. They have what I refer to as an armored front. And what I mean is you see the uh, chest cavity is number one, enclosed by ribs. There's a, a breastbone right here. And then you've got heavily padded uh, neck and shoulders that when they run, uh, so that if they run up behind an animal and that animal tries to kick them, it's going to hit them in an area where they are protected. The vulnerable parts of this animal, in other words, the unprotected abdomen and the gonads, are all the way at the other end where they're least likely to be injured. They have thick, muscular, sturdy neck, uh, forward deployed weapons, and if you've ever looked into the face of a snarling dog, you know exactly what I mean. Um, and that uh, helps them uh, attack their prey, bring it down. Their top speed for most uh, predators is about 35 to 40 miles an hour. Why is that important? That's important because it enables them to capture sick or injured or unwary animals, but it is not fast enough for them to chase down the healthiest animals because the healthiest animals typically can outrun them and uh, uh, outlast them in an uh, endurance race. race. They have what is called a digitigrade stance. What does that mean? That means that they are permanently on their toes. Their skeletons are constructed so that they're always on their toes. Now, when you think about the Olympics, when, um, when uh, human runners, runners get ready to, to run, what does the, the uh, announcer say? He says, runners, on your mark, get set. When he says get set, that's when they get up on their toes, right? To get ready to run. Well, these animals don't have to do that. They're always on their toes, and I'll show you that in a minute. And that increases their leg length, which increases their stride length, which helps to increase their speed. Their nails are sharp claws, which act like sprinter spikes, helps them uh, run faster. It also helps them grapple with prey once they catch up to it. They have permanently flexed joints. Again, when we want to try to run, we've got to get down in a runner's crotch so that we can kind of develop that burst of speed. These animals have permanently flexed joints, so they don't have to get down in a runner's crouch. They're permanently in a runner's crouch. And again, show you that in a minute. But that means that they have to use muscle energy to resist gravity. So right now, we are going to do a little exercise. I need everyone in the room, unless you have a disability, to stand up right where you are. Just stand up. OK. Is anybody having any difficulty standing right now? No. All right. Now, I want everybody to crouch down like this and stay in this position as long as you can. Like we're getting ready to run, but we ain't going nowhere. Now, who is starting to feel that burn in their thighs? You starting to feel that? Why are you feeling that? It's because your muscles are now resisting gravity instead of your skeleton. All right, you guys can have a seat. But that's why your pets, like your dogs and your cats, if they're not actively doing something, they go lay down because it takes energy for them to stand. Because of these permanently flexed joints, they are not able to use their skeletons to resist gravity. And they have, as you can see, these skinny little legs, which lightens, and these tiny feet, which lightens the cost of running and helps them run faster. Um, their senses are optimized for detecting prey, so they have super acute hearing. Their ears move around like little radar dishes to help them localize their prey. 
Their eyesight, they may have binocular vision, but their eyes are constructed very, very differently from ours. Their eyes are optimized for seeing at night. They are also optimized for detecting movement, not seeing fine detail. They have very low resolution. Their sense of smell can be up to 100,000 times more powerful than ours. It's sensitive enough to detect and track prey at great distances, but this is the really important part. Because for years, people thought that when uh, carnivores went out to hunt, they were just randomly hunting animals, kind of like we do. We go out, uh, well, excuse me, some of us, those who are still not evolved enough to know that hunting is disgusting, um, and they go out and they just look for something to shoot. No, these animals actually can smell which animals are sick. And we are now using this ability of these animals to actually detect cancer recurrences in people uh, who've had colon cancer or melanoma. We uh, train companion animals to be able to detect when someone's about to have a seizure or when their blood sugar level is low because that's how powerful these animals' sense of smell is. And so that means that, again, when they're out hunting, they are sniffing the air to find out which one of those animals is sick. Why are they doing that? It's easier to catch, exactly. Less energy out, more energy in, exactly. Now, this is what I was telling you. You see these permanently flexed joints, and you see they're on the tips of their toes. Their heel is actually a third of the way up their leg. Very different uh, construction from uh, humans and herbivores. Now let's look at what I call the vulnerable herbivores, and these are the ones that are uh, hunted by uh, carnivores. Well, clearly they're designed for foraging and can walk long distances at low energy costs because they have very straight legs and their skeletons actually help them stand. They tend to remain active throughout the day as opposed to night. They live in large multifamily family social groups. Their limbs, as I said, are straight, so their bones resist gravity with a minimal um, a minimum of muscle uh, energy. Some of them are so well constructed for standing that they can actually sleep standing up because with four legs, they're like a table. Um, and the, whereas the carnivore's limbs were skinny, their limbs are even skinnier and lighter, which means that that enables them to run even faster than the carnivores. But it gets better. They have what's called an ungular grade. And that's why I meant they're called ungulates. They have an ungular grade stance. That means that they are on point like a ballerina. Instead of standing on the balls of their toes, they are literally standing on the tips of their toes. Furthermore, many of them have lost many of their toes, which is why they will have cloven hooves, like two toes, or in the, uh, some, some of them have three toes, like rhinos and tapirs. And then in the case of horses and other equines, they've gotten down to just one toe. And this, again, allows them not only to run faster, but also gives them greater endurance. You notice that when uh, Western civilization needed to hitch their wagons and stagecoaches to animals, they didn't use lions, tigers, and bears. They used horses and oxen. Uh, their nails, instead of being sharp claws, are flat and blunt. They may have color vision because color vision helps them detect when their food is ripe and can be eaten. They are diurnal, meaning uh, active during the day. And their top speed is typically about 45 to 50 miles an hour, meaning that if they're healthy, they can typically outrun and outlast a predator. Then we reach what are called the invulnerable herbivores. These are the ones that are so large and powerful, they're essentially immune to predation. And what you see there is that they don't have to run that fast. Their top speed is usually only about 25 to 30 miles an hour. Again, they are daytime foragers, but they have these really thick, heavy, straight, pillar-like limbs. They have a largely hairless skin. Their nails are also flat and blunt. They have large, heavy feet, and so because they don't have to move their feet very fast, and may have a flat uh, foot or plantigrade-like stance. And like humans, elephants are long-lived social mammals that live in large family groups of various sizes. And in general, 
Terrestrial herbivorous mammals live much longer than the carnivores. These mammals are a living testament to the adequacy of plant protein. They eat nothing but plants, but they're the biggest things on land on the planet. Clearly, there's plenty of protein in plants. So this is just a uh, drawing showing a cat skeleton drawn to scale to compare with an elephant's, and you see the differences immediately. The cat has the flexed joints, the elephant has the straight joints, meaning that when it's standing, its uh, skeleton is resisting gravity as opposed to its muscles. Now, let's talk about the energy cost of locomotion. For all animals, if you graft walking speed versus the energy utilized, you see that you get a straight line, meaning the faster the animal walks, the more energy it requires. That's different only for human beings. For humans, you get a parabola. You see, you get this curve here. And what that means is you get this energy savings that we mean, and this means that we use less energy for over a wide range of walking speeds than would be predicted for an animal our size. How do we do that? Is it magic? It has to do with the way we stand and how our bodies are constructed. So, again, for all other animals, their center of mass is actually located down between their uh, base of support. And that means that even when they're walking, their center of mass stays within their base of support and they remain very stable. It's not true for human beings. Our center of mass is actually located on top of our base of support, it's up here. And that means that every time our legs swing out, your center of mass actually falls outside of your body and you start to fall. And that means that as you're falling, instead of you generating energy to move forward, gravity is moving you forward. Is that clear to people? So because of the way we stand, we actually have learned to utilize gravity to do part of the work of moving us forward. And that's why even if, if you stub your toe even a little bit, it makes you look so stupid and goofy. Because really, walking for human beings is just falling forward. It's just we do it as a finely tuned balance and we catch ourselves before we fall on our face. But anything that interrupts the swing of that leg will make us look like we are just, you know, I don't know, one of the Marx Brothers. Um, and, but, but what that means is that human beings are the ultimate foragers. We're wonderful walkers, we're lousy runners. We can't run very far, and we can't run very fast. But we can walk forever at a very low energy cost. Oops. All right, so when we look at how humans are constructed, you see, we're designed for walking while foraging. We have a completely unprotected, uh, exposed anatomy. If we run up behind uh, an animal and start pestering it, we're likely to get kicked in our abdomen, which means that we can be disemboweled, or we get kicked someplace lower, and Lord knows, God help us. <laughs> uh, we, and instead of presenting the smallest area or cross-section to the wind, we actually present the widest area of our body as a cross-section to the wind. That, again, means that we are inefficient runners. But why would nature do that? Why would nature have us, or God, if you will, have us present the widest area of our body as a cross-section to the wind when we're moving forward? It's because it's designed to create a bunch of air currents swirling about our body. What would be the point of that? What is your radiator for in your car? Cooling. Cooling. And what does your radiator cool in your car? Your engine. So what do we have that we need to keep cool on our body? Huh? 
Okay, I've heard skin. Actually, the skin is the radiator. But what is the skin designed to cool? Muscle. Uh, that's a good thought, but that ain't it. Huh? Organs. Which one? The heart. Actually, the heart, there's so much blood flowing through the heart, the heart stays nice and cool. The brain. Yes. Do you know that every day, your brain, which only accounts for 3% of your body weight, uses 25% of the energy you burn. Your brain alone. That means every given minute, your brain is generating gigantic amounts of heat. But it's enclosed in bone, and heat does not radiate across bone. So the only way to get that heat out of the skull is the same way your car engine gets rid of its heat. It circulates water through the engine to pick up the heat, takes that out to the radiator, and releases it to the environment. Our bodies do the same thing with our naked skin. The blood, uh, um, the, the brain receives 20% of the heart's cardiac output. So any given moment, 20% of your blood is flowing through your, to, through your brain, picking up all that heat, bringing it out to your skin, and releasing it to the environment. The back of my shirt right now is, is, is wet, and by the end of this lecture, it's going to be soaking wet. And that's because I'm using my brain to talk to you, and it's generating a lot of energy. And my body's getting rid of it by bringing it up to my skin. So that's why we have these flat, non-aerodynamic bodies and naked skin so that we can help get rid of all of this uh, uh, excess heat produced by our brains. Now, why, again, why is that important? Well, what is the normal temperature for a human body? It's about 98.6 degrees. What happens if your core temperature gets up to 104 degrees as an adult? Yeah, you die. You're, get, you're dead. You're gone. That's like six degrees, ladies and gentlemen. So that means that the brain is exquisitely sensitive to uh, elevations in temperature. It's got to be kept cool to function properly. Anybody here ever have a high fever? I once had uh, the, like, a flu-like illness, and my temperature got up to 103, and I'm telling you, I felt like I was walking around encased in cotton. I couldn't, I mean, it's, it's like I could barely think. The human brain does not like elevations in temperature, and it's got to be kept cool. And that's why we have the body structure we have. We also have heavy, straight, pillar-like legs with these loose, mobile joints that make our walking very efficient. Very large, heavy, flexible feet, uh, hairless skin, flat, blunt nails, and essentially our lifestyle factors make us invulnerable to predation. And our slow speed and poor endurance are really most useful for escaping stinging insects, but are useless for um, uh, chasing down uh, any prey. Now, that's, that's kind of a... Uh, you know, a glib thing to say. Oh, it's, it's useful for uh, uh, escaping insects. How do I know that? Okay. How fast is the fastest human being? Usain Bolt, at his fastest. He, runs, he hits maybe about 25 to 26 miles an hour. And, and most of us can't even get close to that. How uh, uh, long can a human being maintain top speed? You've all seen the Olympics. No, no, I'm talking about distance-wise. No, top speed. All right. In the 100-meter in the dash, the guys are still running full bore, right? But what happens in the 200-meter dash? In the last 50 yards, they start slowing down. And that's because we can only maintain top speed for about 150 yards. How fast do bees and wasps fly? 20 miles an hour. How far will they chase you around their nest? 200 meters. Again, our running ability is meant to help us get away from stinging insects while we're out foraging for food. But there is no uh, animal that you can chase down in 200 meters, uh, um, especially 
as slow as we are, because they would be halfway across the savannah. That gets even more interesting because clearly pregnant human women are absolutely incapable of, of hunting. They can't go out and wrestle with some animal or chase it down um, because they would kill themselves and their baby. So how did you know, anthropologists deal with this? Well, since the early anthropologists were men, they made crap up. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, the women hung out at the door of the cave waiting for the man to bring home the bison. And you know what Mo Mother Nature said? She said, bull crap. Because there is no species in nature where the female of the species is unable to procure the food she needs for her own life and to support a pregnancy and raise her young. Nowhere in nature. Because Mother Nature knows what every single woman in this room knows, and that is that men are too damn undependable to stake your life on them, okay? So it's ludicrous to postulate that, um, human, that the human species would uh, um, create a situation where a pregnant woman would have to be dependent on a man who might get killed and not be able to, to uh, bring her to the foods that she needs to survive. Female of every species is always able to procure the food that she needs. The long gestation period of humans is typical of large herbivores, as we'll see. And human fetal development suggests being an herbivore was a pre necessary prerequisite for our brain development. Single births are the rule with humans, with occasional twins. And our babies are large relative to their, mother, to their mother's body weight, which again is typical for herbivores. And babies are born with their eyes open, which is a sign of brain development. So this is a uh, chart showing you the length of gestation for carnivores versus herbivores and humans. And you see the carnivores all have very short gestation periods. Um, the longest is roughly about 16 weeks in a lion, but that's very short. Um, and that's because a heavily pregnant female can't be out there chasing down and wrestling with an animal because she'll kill herself and her young. So they have their babies at a very immature stage of development and essentially the babies uh, finish their development outside the womb. Whereas, you see, the herbivores all have very long gestation periods of 40 weeks or more. Human beings are right there with the rest of the herbivores. Let's look at neonate birth weight as a percentage of the mother's body weight. Again, gigantic differences. Carnivores have tiny little babies. Herbivores have, relatively speaking, huge babies. When you look at the, the uh, neonate's birth weight relative to the mother's body weight, the herbivores invest a lot more energy uh, and, uh, into their babies than the carnivores do. That's why carnivores have litters, expecting a lot of them to die. The herbivores have one or two babies, expecting to expend a lot of time, attention, and energy to keep that baby alive. Well, uh, again, Brenda talked to you uh, a little bit about milk, so I'm not going to belabor a lot of this, except I just want you guys to see that carnivores uh, have very different milk, uh, milks from uh, uh, the herbivores. The carnivores typically have a lot more fat uh, and a lot more protein in their milk than the two herbiv herbivorous species at the bottom. And that's because, again, their babies have to finish developing outside the womb, they're growing much faster, so they need a lot more energy in the form of fat, and they need a lot more protein. Uh, but let's just look at the uh, two herbivores, if you will. You see that in the first column, the total solids are pretty much the same. Cows, 12.3, humans, 12.0. Uh, look at the percentage of fat. Is it the same or different? Remember, I'm going to start pointing. It's the same. Does anybody disagree with that? All right. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. What about the amount of protein? Big difference. And if you can read, I'm, you know, I've already given you the answers. <laughs> um, there's a lot more protein in the cow's milk. So let me ask you, why is that? Again, I hear mumbling, but I want some answers. Because, okay, the, the calf, calf is bigger, but it has to grow faster, exactly. 
Remember, ladies and gentlemen, protein, proteins are building blocks. And you only need a lot of protein if you're growing very fast. What is the most, what is the slowest growing species on the planet? Huh? Earthworm. Well, earthworm. <laughs> no, that ain't it. <laughs> what is the slowest growing species on the planet? Huh? If someone says a sloth. No, sloths only take about a year and a half, two years to reach maturity. Humans! Humans take 20 years to reach maturity. 18 to 20 years. And that's why we have the lowest protein content of any mammal on the planet in our milk. But what's important for you guys to know is that the type of protein in cow's milk and human milk is very different. The protein in cow's milk has, is, is much more growth stimulatory. And that's not a good thing because it means that kids raised on cow's milk are much more prone to develop cancer and heart disease and other metabolic problems as they age. Now, let me come back to that fat content. We said it's the same, but is it the same kind of fat? Can you churn butter from human milk? No, you can't. Can you make ice cream from human milk? No, you can't. If you have seen human breast milk, it is thin and translucent, whereas cow's milk is white and opaque. That's because the fat in cow's milk is highly saturated. That's why you can churn butter out of it and make ice cream. So again, even though they may superficially look similar, they're very different. Now, let's look at that last column, lactose. Lactose is the, amount, is the sugar that's in milk. Who has more lactose? Humans. Hmm. Well, if the baby cow is growing faster and if the baby cow is bigger, why does the human have more lactose? To feed the brain, exactly. Because proportionately, the baby's, human baby's brain is much bigger than a, a baby cow's brain. And that means if you raise your baby or your grandchildren on cow's milk, you are starving their brains. There's not enough sugar in it because the brain only uses sugar for its metabolism. You see, God, nature, whoever you want to attribute this to, knew what they were doing when they designed these milks. They designed them for the species. All right. I've already gone over all this, so we're just going to uh, move on. Let's look at the head and neck region. So when you look at carnivores, what you notice is they have reduced facial, facial muscles. That allows them to open their mouths very wide so they can run up and grab onto to something to bring it down. The major uh, muscle operating the lower jaw is the temporalis muscle, which sits on the top of their head. When you pet your dog or your cat, you're actually petting their temporalis muscle. Um, their teeth are designed, as you can see, for ripping, tearing, and cutting. They do not chew their food. They just slice off a huge chunk of meat and swallow it. Therefore, their jaw is very stable, has minimal side-to-side -side movement, and their saliva has no enzymes because they can't release uh, digestive enzymes in their mouth, otherwise they wouldn't have a mouth. So when you look at the actual jaw structure, you see that the jaw joint is on the same plane as the cheek teeth, and that allows the jaws to act like a pair of shears. You notice that the molars in the upper jaw slide completely past the molars in the lower jaw, and that means that when the jaws close, they close like with a cutting action, like a pair of shears. The other thing I want to point out is this area called the angle of the mandible in carnivores is vestigial because the muscles that attach there in meat eaters don't do anything. Um, uh, and so the angle of the mandible is not expanded. And they have very powerful jaws. Uh, when you look at the bite strength, uh, and bite forces generated. You see the dogs can get up to 450 pounds per square inch, wolves over 500, jaguars 700 pounds per square inch, uh, lions and tigers up to 900 pounds, hyenas over 1,000 pounds per square inch, and by contrast, we can barely manage 150 pounds per square inch, meaning we can do a walnut but not a Brazil nut. <laughs> well, the herbivores, again, completely different. Number one, they have a walled-in oral 
cavity. So they have very well-developed facial muscles, small opening into the oral cavity, uh, very well-developed uh, uh, lips. But you notice that the angle of the mandible is expanded because the muscles that attach here, the uh, masseters on the outside, what are called pterygoids on the inside, are the primary muscles operating the lower jaw. This area at top where the uh, temporalis sits is almost non-existent because the temporalis muscle does very little in plant-eating animals. And the main thing that you notice is that the jaw joint in plant-eating animals has moved to a position above the plane of the cheek teeth. That imparts an L shape to the lower jaw, meaning that when the jaw closes, instead of closing in a zipper-like fashion, the teeth, teeth come together on top of each other to form, to form these extended grinding platforms. And this above the plane of the cheek teeth type of jaw is so important for processing plant foods, it is believed to have evolved uh, uh, I think 15 different times independently throughout mammalian uh, evolution. And the teeth are designed for cropping and grinding. Angle of the mandible is expanded. The lower jaw has pronounced side to side uh, movements. And this is for the grinding movements of chewing because you have to chew plant foods in order to extract the nutrients uh, in plant tissues. Salivary amylase is an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrate, uh, which is found in the saliva of many plant-eating species. So a uh, picture of molars, of uh, the meat eaters versus uh, plant eaters. You see that the carnivores have these blade-like uh, mo um, molars that are shaped like little steak knives, whereas the herbivores, such as humans, have flat nodular molars for uh, grinding. The jaw joint in carnivores closes in a vertical fashion. The uh, teeth slide past each other in a vertical fashion. In the herbivores, they slide across each other in a horizontal fashion. If there is anyone in this room whose teeth slide past each other vertically, please see me after the lecture. I will get you some help. <laughs> but this means that herbivores can do something carnivores can't. Because of the walled-in oral cavity and the small opening, herbivores can create a vacuum, meaning they can suck up water. Carnivores can't create a vacuum, that's why they have to lap up their water. So your ability to use a straw, you owe to being an herbivore. The esophagus is the tube that leads from the mouth to the stomach, and carnivores is very wide and stretchy, allows them to swallow these huge hunks of, of meat and bone and, uh, not get, uh, uh, and not choke themselves to death, Whereas in the herbivores, it's narrow and muscular, and they can only handle a uh, small bolus of thoroughly chewed food. In human beings, 90% of the people who choke to death every year choke to death on, guess what, meat. And hot dogs are the number one culprit. So moving on to the upper uh, gastrointestinal tract, uh, just to make uh, uh, some important points, animal foods are actually very easily digested because Animal cells have a cell membrane made up of fatty molecules. Inside, there's some water, some protein, some more fat, but there's no fiber, there's no cell, uh, 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 cell wall. There's a cell membrane, but no cell wall. Therefore, uh, animals that eat uh, meat don't need a long or elaborate uh, digestive tract. So they have a simple stomach, but it has very powerful acid, meaning that when it has food in it, they can secrete enough acid to get the pH of their stomach down to less than one. That's stronger than battery acid. And it's necessary so they can dissolve hooves, bones, and the tough connective tissue that makes up hides. They have gigantic stomachs. Their stomachs hold up to 60 to 70% of the total gut capacity, and it enables them to consume up to 30% of their body weight at one meal. And that means it's designed for in intermittent feeding. Why is that important? Is hunting efficient or inefficient? Okay, so for every 10 times a carnivore goes out to hunt, how often are they successful? It's actually one, once or twice out of 10 times. So let me ask you something. I'm going to point now. If 90% of the time you sat down to have a meal, somebody snatched your food away and didn't let you eat, what would happen to you? You'd starve to death, right? Because you would not be able to ingest enough calories 
during that 10% you were allowed to eat to last you or to keep you healthy. That's why carnivores need these giant stomachs. Because hunting is so inefficient, they have to be, once they actually get some food, they've got to be able to consume enough calories to recover all of the calories that they expended chasing things they didn't catch and still have enough left over to sustain them until they can get another meal as well as do any um, uh, uh, physical repair and, and so on that they need to do. Make, does that make sense to people? All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, this young lady asked me, well, does that mean that because we, we tend in Western countries to eat a lot, that we're um, uh, eating 30% of our body weight? Um, so how much do you weigh? 132 pounds. 30% 30 of your body weight would be uh, 36 pounds of food. Do you eat 36 pounds of food a day? There's no way you can eat that much food. The, the, I, she says the size of a stomach has changed. It is nowhere near large enough for you to eat 36 pounds of food. It's impossible. We, have, we cannot consume 30% of our body weight uh, in a day. On, on average, human beings like other herbivores, we eat about 3.3% of our body weight every day. Not 30, uh, 30%. I tell you, maybe, I'm a, maybe I should keep it up here. Uh, and again, so as I said, the huge uh, uh, capacity is necessary because hunting is so inefficient. Stomach that can hold 30% uh, of an animal's body weight means a 45 kilo, uh, 50 kilogram wolf can eat up to 34 pounds of meat at a sitting. A uh, uh, 300 pound lioness can eat 100 pounds of meat at a sitting. And so for this 50 kilogram wolf, or dog if you will, they can consume 21,000 calories at a single meal. We can't even come close to that. And that's enough energy, again, to recover what they wasted and still last them until they can catch something else. Their small intestine actually is very short because the, once the uh, meat is liquefied in the stomach, the protein and fat is very easily absorbed, and so they don't need a lot of surface area. And then uh, it's passed on to the large intestine, what's, whatever residue is less, left over, so they can quickly uh, get it out of the body. And this is some pictures of uh, carnivore digestive tracts. And essentially what you see, big stomach, short, small intestine, short, straight, uh, large intestine. All right. Well, plants are different, right? Because plants don't have bones. As a result, they have to use insoluble fibers to stiffen and protect their tissues. As a result, in addition to a cell wall, every plant has, I mean, excuse me, in addition to a cell membrane, every plant cell has a cell wall made up of cellulose, which is fiber. Well, what's the issue with cellulose? The issue with cellulose is that no mammal makes enzymes that digest cellulose. Okay? We don't make enzymes that digest cellulose. Are there any creatures that do make enzymes that digest cellulose? Bacteria, exactly. And, well, okay, yeah, we're kind of back to the termites. Yeah. <laughs> and this brings up the fact that there are two main ways of dealing with plant foods, depending on what kind of plant foods you eat. Those animals like the ruminants, like cows, antelope, that eat mainly grass, hay, high cellulose containing foods, they are the ones that have the four stomachs. Why? Because in that first stomach is a soup made up of bacteria and protozoa that release cellulose digesting enzymes. That's why what will happen is the cow goes out in the morning and she just scoops up a bunch of grass, swallows it, lets it soak up those enzymes, then she brings it back up and does what with it? Chews it. 
Because chewing is designed to break apart the plant material, mix it with the enzymes to allow that process of digestion to begin. Then when she swallows it, it goes into a different stomach and the, the process uh, proceeds uh, uh, apace. Animals like uh, horses and other herbivores that eat high energy plant foods like grains and root vegetables and fruits, they, they, it would be inefficient for them to have a uh, uh, four stomach uh, type of digestive system because the bacteria would util, use up all of that energy in an apple or in a, uh, uh, some corn. So instead, they have a simple stomach, liquefy the meal, send it through their small intestine, extract the readily avail available nutrients, and they send the leftover fiber into the colon where bacteria or the microbiome in the colon then starts to break down that fiber and they extract additional nutrients from it. And you can tell the difference between the two digestive schemes by looking at what comes out. The four stomach fermenters have a very efficient process and they produce a liquid stool. And if you've ever seen a fresh cow patty, you know exactly what I mean. Whereas the hindgut fermenters, like the horses, produce a much more solid fuel, uh, stool that has a lot of undigested fiber in it. So we're just gonna focus on the herbivores with simple stomachs since we only have a simple stomach. It holds less than 30% of the total gut capacity. That and herbivores on average eat about 3.3% of their body weight over the course of the day. But they have to eat multiple times to even achieve that. It is only mild to moderately acidic when it's full with food. It, the pH is around 4.5 to 5. Uh, it's designed for batch feeding. So we saw in the carnivores, they're designed for intermittent feeding. They'll eat today, won't eat for a week or more. The herbivores all have to eat multiple meals every single day in order to remain alive. They cannot hold enough calories at a single meal to last them a single day. And um, again, they have to eat several times every day. Um, their small intestine, on the other hand, is much, much longer than that of the carnivores. The herbivore small intestine is 10 to 12 times body length, and that's because fiber slows down the extraction of these nutrients, so they need a lot more surface area. And it has an adjustable mix of carbohydrate, fat, and protein digestion enzymes, unlimited capacity to absorb carbohydrate. Here's some examples. And so you see rabbit, dick dick, which is an antelope, has a multiple stomachs, and then the zebra. But notice on, uh, at both ends that the colon has this sacculated pouched appearance, and in the rabbit you also see the presence of an appendix, which we'll come back to. And then just quickly looking at the lower digestive tract, the carnivore colon, again, straight, smooth because whatever residue reaches uh, this point, there's no more nutrition to be gained. It can only start to putrefy and rot inside the body. So they want to get it out of, the body, out of their body as, long, as quickly as possible. Um, and so they don't need a large storage capacity. Contrast that with the plant eaters. Because fiber can be broken down by uh, bacteria, into a lot of bioactive uh, and energy-containing compounds. They have this saculated uh, structure to their colon, which increases its capacity. It's much longer and does a lot of things, uh, such as uh, 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 vitamin production, creating short-chain fatty acids, which uh, uh, change um, physiology. It enhances uh, the activity of a variety of plant compounds and water absorption. All right, now let's move on to humans. Well, the main thing uh, that we need to understand is that humans have the palate preferences and importantly, psychology of an herbivore. We naturally love and crave the taste, textures, colors, and variety of plant foods. So we are not only herbivores by our anatomy and physiology, but also our psychology. Because in order to survive in nature, you not only have to be able to procure whatever food you're supposed to eat, but you also have to be attracted to it. And that's why we are attracted to bright colors. We are attracted to smooth, rounded shapes. We're attracted to things that are firm and things that taste like plants. Now, 
This is a Far Side cartoon. It says, Rusty makes his move. Notice he's got a can of dog breath. Well, <laughs> we see that carnivores will often, when they find a dead rotting carcass, they will go roll in it and then go back to their pack mates. Why do they do that? Because they are showing their pack mates, hey, I know where food is. If you want to have something to eat, you need to hang out with me. So the question is, if we're natural flesh eaters, why don't we arrive at our date's door wearing scraps of meat and smelling like rotten flesh rather than flowers and fruit? You know, why don't we make our perfumes and colognes to say, oh, uh, instead of, you know, uh, uh, um, Chanel number no. five, we could have like slaughterhouse number no. four or rotting carcass, you know, number no. six. It's because our brain is telling us what it wants. It wants the plant compounds. That's why we like to smell like plant compounds. Furthermore, we are so in love and so uh, 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 in need of plants that we create all of these artificial product products to make our homes actually smell like plants. And that's because human beings developed as a species dependent on flowering plants. That is why flowering plants are so important to us, because we are a plant and fruit eating species. And our brain knows that if we are ingesting plants, if we are around plants, we will be healthier and live longer. And guess what? That's exactly what science is telling us. But it actually gets even more interesting than that. Because in order to make animal tissue uh, acceptable, we have to disguise it to play tricks on our mind because we don't like it in its natural form. So we try to make it look like plants. Look at that. You got a pear and a lamb chop, apples and meatballs, bananas and sausages, celery and bacon, <laughs> a squash and a drumstick. We have to change the way animal tissue looks to make it acceptable, but not just the way it looks, but also the way it tastes and smells. So even things like sushi, we chop it so that it looks like raw fruit. We are doing this so that we will not react with a disgust response. By the way, these slides are taken from a lecture called Meat Eating and Mind Games. You can find it on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, type in Dr. Milton Mills, Meat Eating and Mind Games, and the lecture will come up. The uh, first uh, slide about uh, our, uh, plant, our, our uh, love of flowering plants comes from a lecture of mine called Flowers in the Human Intellect, how uh, uh, plants helped us develop as a species. That lecture is not online. You got that right. Your brain is like, all right, man, let's, let's get it on. All right, so when you look at human teeth, clearly our incisors are designed for cropping and peeling fruit. And people say, well, what about my canines? What about these? And I'm like, what about your canines? <laughs> the human canines have become modified incisors. They're small, they're rounded, they act like incisors. They are useless for ripping open anything other than an envelope. But they are absolutely... Uh, uh, of no use in trying to eat meat. Our molars slide across each other horizontally in the typical fashion of an herbivore. You see that the human jaw joint has moved to a position above the plane of the cheek teeth, giving our jaw, lower jaw this L shape, just like all the other herbivores, and the major muscles operating the lower jaw, again, are the masseters and the pterygoids. All right, so everybody, put your hands right here and bite down. You feel that muscle popping out? That's the masseter. Pterygoids are on the inside. They hold the lower jaw in a sling-like arrangement, move it back and forth uh, uh, and frontwards and backwards to help you grind your food. And this is just a comparison showing you whose jaw yours look like. You can see, just like the horse. By the way, horses have small canines just like we do. Um, expanded angle of mandible, jaw joint above the plane of the cheek teeth, our jaws look nothing like that of the wolf or the carnivore. So just stop it with all this nonsense about, oh, I'm a carnivore. No, you're not. And you can keep playing those games, but you're going to pay for it with heart attacks and cancer and other diseases. 
Uh, we have well-developed facial muscles, walled and oral cavity, fleshy lips, which I know you thought the purpose of our lips was for kissing. That's a fringe benefit. The real purpose is to help us move food into our mouths. Uh, our cheek muscles help us in chewing. And the temporalis muscle, which sits up here in humans, is almost vestigial, does next to nothing. Uh, this is an inside view of the human oral cavity, and you can see the pterygoid is right here. It's opposite the, uh, uh, the masseter, and uh, importantly, the parotid uh, salivary gland, which sits right in front of your ear, is the salivary gland that makes the enzyme salivary amylase, which starts breaking down carbohydrate as you're chewing your food. Our tongue is very thick and muscular, helps in uh, chewing our food, but it also helps in speech. And what's also really interesting is that because of the structure of the human pharynx, uh, meaning this part of uh, um, our throat, we almost certainly have a much wider and broader range of, of taste and flavor perception than any other animal because no other creature on this planet has the same pharynx structure. And most of what we perceive as taste and flavor comes not from the tongue, but actually from um, smell molecules that travel back down the throat into, uh, oh, excuse me, I had that exactly backwards, that travel from the food that we're chewing up into the uh, olfactory uh, cavity or the nose, and it's what uh, uh, the uh, perception of those flavor molecules that we are tasting. That's why when you have a bad cold, you can't taste your food. As I've already said, esophagus is very narrow. Muscular uh, should only be handling soft, chewed plant foods. Most of the people who choke to death choke on meat. Uh, people who are suffering from uh, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease or super bad uh, uh, heartburn, uh, it's usually because they're eating food, diets that are high in meat and fat and untreated that can lead to cancer. The human stomach is small, uh, is only moderately acidic with food, uh, only holds about 25% of the entire gut capacity. In order to get enough calories to uh, sustain us, we have to, like all herbivores, batch feed, meaning we have to eat multiple meals over the course of the day to survive. Um, and the average adult human consumes about 5.4, 5.5 pounds of food, and that's about 3.3% of our body weight. And because of the small capacity of our stomach and our inability to dead rotting tissue, uh, we can't extract energy from a carcass the way carnivores can. That's why hunting for us is a waste of time. You ex um, when humans go out to hunt in Stone Age societies without refrigerators and freezers, they would expend all of this energy chasing an animal, and they could only extract a very small amount of calories from that animal before the body became inedible. So that's a waste of time. And that's why it was really the women who had kept us alive as, as a species. You know that, right? In Stone Age society, 80% of the calories consumed come from the gathering efforts of women. What the men, uh, 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 first of all, most of the time the men go out to hunt, they come home empty handed. And what they do bring back doesn't really supply uh, very much from a, nutri a nutri nutritional standpoint. So my theory is that hunting was invented by women. Now, why would I say that? Well, think about it. No, think, think, think about it. Men who, who go out to hunt, they hang out with other guys, they spend all day chasing stuff they never catch, and then they come home tired and appreciative for the food that their wives provide. Whereas if they're sitting at home doing nothing, they could be out chasing you know what. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, hunting is not efficient for humans. And I got a bunch of slides that actually go into greater detail, but I really can't, we don't have time to, 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 to uh, uh, review that. Uh, just This is really like a two-hour lecture that's been compressed into one. And quite frankly, this topic, I could do a whole 10-day conference on this design question all by myself. It is that, there's that much information to be learned. But we're, get, we're just kind of doing the, uh, the real uh, uh, important points here. And when you graft mammals out, they fall on three, uh, along three, three lines. When you graft body size versus absorptive area, there the uh, 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 
uh, folivores are animals that eat foliage. The farnivores, uh, these are the animals that eat other animals. And then the frugivores, those that eat the uh, uh, fruit or high energy uh, plant foods. And then when you uh, look at human body size versus absorptive area, we are clearly on the frugivore uh, 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 graft. But we do have adaptations <coughs> in our uh, intestines that have equipped us to, to eat more green leafy uh, type plants. Human small intestines, extremely long for an animal our size, is about 30 to 35 feet. Remember I said for herbivores, it's 10 to 12 times body length. You might say, wait a minute, I'm six foot tall. So I have a small intestine that's 30 feet. That's not 10 times. Yes, it is, because body size is me measured head to tailbone, not head to uh, toe. And the average uh, torso length in human beings is two and a half to three feet, classic proportions. But it's uh, even better because the small intestine is compressed like an accordion. And then when you look at the mucosa, it's thrown up in these little finger-like projections. And then when you look on the surface of those, you see they have uh, what are called microvilli. The enzymes lining our small intestine are a mixture of carbohydrate, protein, and fat-digesting enzymes. And I'll just tell you a little anecdote. When I was doing my um, gross anatomy in medical school, our cadaver was a little lady who was five foot four. And when we removed her small intestine and stretched it out across the room, it was 32 feet long. So yeah, we have the classic proportions of a, a plant eater. And then you look at our accessory organs of digestion, the liver, pancreas, gallbladder. Uh, liver is responsible uh, for manufacturing bile. Bile is stored in the gallbladder. Uh, and uh, what does bile do? Bile is a detergent. It emulsifies the fat, which allows us to absorb it into our bloodstream. All the blood that's drained from the digestive tract passes through the liver before it gets into the general uh, uh, circulation, and the liver detoxifies anything that could cause a reaction and modifies these uh, dietary components so that they're useful to the body. And then it also extracts things from the bloodstream that ultimately get excreted in the feces. The pancreas is responsible for uh, manufacturing the uh, enzymes that digest the food that we eat. So it makes proteases, which dig digest proteins, lipases, uh, which uh, break apart fats, and then the amylases, which digest starches. And also, uh, the pancreas has beta cells, which manufacture insulin that helps to control blood sugar. So you have what I call phase one, enzymatic digestion. Um, bile, as I said, emulsifies fat and cholesterol. They are absorbed and then either get deposited in fat cells or burned for energy. Um, your pancreatic enzymes, you have five different proteases which recognize different uh, uh, bonds amongst the various amino acids. And with the five different proteases, you're able to break apart every protein into its constituent amino acids. Importantly, each enzyme recognizes and breaks apart a specific type of what are called peptide bonds. Those are the ones that join amino acids together. Animal and plant proteins differ only in the relative proportions of amino acids and protein structure, not in the types of bonds. All animal proteins and all plant proteins are made up of the same 20 amino acids, just in differing proportions. So you can think of it like a ship, a car, a washing machine, and an airplane are all made out of metal. It's just how that metal is put together determines what you end up with. Same thing with the proteins. Lipases, <coughs> excuse me, uh, breaks apart the uh, triglycerides into free fatty acids, and amylases breaks down starches. Well, then you get to phase two, or fermentation, uh, and that's where uh, the bacteria in the microbiome act on the leftover fiber to break it down. Now, why am I showing you fossilized poop? It's because I want you to understand that this paleo craze is a bunch of bull, okay? When you actually look at what the people who are, li who are alive during paleolithic times left behind for us to see, it was poop that was full of fiber. These people were eating 100 to 150 uh, grams of unprocessed fiber per day. They weren't eating uh, uh, meat because they couldn't catch meat. And they certainly couldn't eat dead, rotting corpses because they would have poisoned themselves. They were eating plants. So the true paleo diet is a plant-based diet. This crap that people are doing is nonsense, and that's why studies show that people who eat paleo diets are more likely to end up dead. 
Uh, this is a quote from a book called Topics in Dietary Fiber. It says, the role of dietary fiber in pre-agricultural subsistence economy of early human populations strongly suggests that for over 99% of human existence as a distinct species, our gastrointestinal tract was exposed to the selective pressures exerted by coarse, high-residue diet of plant tissues. I kind of took the sexism out of that quote. So when you look at our colon, it's extremely long, has the typical pouch structure of uh, herbivores, has an appendix, which is only found in plant-eating uh, animals. The primary functions are water absorption, breaking down uh, leftover fiber into the short-chain fatty acids, uh, which uh, 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 improve our physiology, produces some vitamins, and uh, finally elimination. Turns out food spends more time in your colon than it does anywhere else. So, how do I know that? Well, let me ask you, how long does a meal spend inside your body? Two hours? Who said two hours? No. I, then, then, then that would have meant that everybody in here would have been running out to poop already. No. Well, you know, I once had someone ask me, Dr. Mills, how do I know how long a meal stays in my body? Everything that comes out looks alike, right? So I told him, I said, this is what you do. Next time you eat whole kernel corn, look at your watch when you eat it, and then look at the time when you see it again. If you're eating a good high-fiber diet, it will average about 14 to 16 hours. So let's say 16 hours. So how long does food stay in the stomach? About two hours. How long does it take for a meal to pass through the 30 to 35 feet of the small intestine? Actually, less than two hours. So we've only accounted for four hours max. So that means the, the rest of that uh, uh, 10 to 12 hours, it's in your colon. And what's it doing there? Hanging out like relatives that won't go home? <laughs> no. It's being acted on by the microbiome to create these short-chain fatty acids and other compounds that improve your health. That's if you're eating the right foods and you have the right microbiome. So one of the things that they can do is they activate these phytoestrogens and plant compounds called lignans, and breast cancer risk was decreased by 22% in women with the highest lignin intake. Whole grain rye decreased uh, uh, PSA uh, in men with prostate cancer by 14%. Consumption of soy uh, phytoestrogen reduces both breast cancer and prostate cancer risk in a dose-dependent fashion, meaning the more you eat, the uh, uh, lower the risk. Metabolism of phytoestrogens uh, by these bacterial strains makes them more bioavailable. And bacterial strains that are most effective are those associated with plant-based diets. And this is an example of what happens when you eat the right foods. So what you see here is that when you're eating a high-fiber diet, you have this really thick layer of mucus that has kind of this two uh, phases to it. In the upper layer, you have your bacteria, which are breaking down the fiber. Most importantly, they're creating this uh, uh, short-chain fatty acid that has four carbons called butyrate. Why is butyrate important? It's because colonic cells prefer to use butyrate for their, as their energy source as opposed to extracting uh, uh, nutrition from the bloodstream. So when there's plenty of butyrate present, you see that the, there are nice tight junctions here. The colon cells look very healthy and very happy. You don't get leakage of colon content into your bloodstream. All right? And I'm trying, kind of rushing because uh, I'm about to run out of time. And also, this mucus layer has antibiotic properties in it that kill off bad guys and only let the good guys uh, survive. But what happens if you're not eating enough fiber? Well, you see that, number one, you don't have a thick layer of mucus, and because you're not creating that butyrate, these colon cells are sickly, they can't maintain tight junctions, you start to get slippage of bacteria and bacterial antigens in between the colon cells, and that, my friends, is leaky gut syndrome. And you guys will be able to read all this information when you uh, get the uh, um, uh, the information from uh, uh, the organizers. It's all there. And studies have shown that leaky gut uh, uh, correlates with a higher risk for depression. 
because um, lipopolysaccharide uh, 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 is a uh, bacterial antigen that um, is higher, uh, uh, people who have major depression have higher uh, levels of antibodies against lipopo lipoprotein polysaccharide, um, uh, meaning that it shows that they are suffering from this leaky gut mechanism. Um, whereas when people go onto plant-based diets, their colons tend to heal themselves, that, uh, acts, that process reverses, and they're much less prone to having depression. Well, what about dementia? Does diet have anything to do with dementia? Well, this is uh, uh, showing you how much meat people eat around the world. The darker the country, the more meat. Why is that important? It's because when you look at Alzheimer's disease, what you see is that the more meat a country eats, the higher the incidence and rate of Alzheimer's. The more plant-based a country's diet, the lower their risk of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, okay? So places like Iceland, the US, Denmark, eating a lot of meat and dairy, very high rates of Alzheimer's. Places where people eat a more plant-based diet, very low rates of Alzheimer's and other dementias. And we now know that our gut is directly connected to our brain, that the bacteria in the gut make neurotransmitters that actually travel to the central nervous system, help your brain function more smoothly, uh, lowers the risk for uh, depression, uh, anxiety, and other disorders. Uh, uh, let me kind of power through these slides and I'll come back to you. And then just in general, again, inflammation, the higher the levels of inflammation, the greater the risk for ultimately developing dementia. Uh, tumor necros tumor, TNF is tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is a, uh, a sign of inflammation. And again, uh, the higher the level, the greater the risk of dementia. So just to uh, touch on some issues of physiology, do uh, carnivores worry about fat and cholesterol? No, they don't. Dogs will not develop car heart disease. Dogs and other carnivores, no matter how much fat and cholesterol you feed them, because they can dispose of it without forming uh, blockages in their arteries. They don't develop gallstones. One of the reasons bear bile is prized in uh, Chinese medicine is because when um, uh, you drink bear bile, the body will take that bile and uh, store it in our gallbladder, and bear bile is so strong, it actually dissolves human uh, cholesterol gallstones. But we also have medicines that do that now, so we don't have to go around killing bar, uh, bears. Um, carnivores can detoxify preformed vitamin A, and they manufacture their own vitamin C, whereas we cannot because we are plant dependent. They make urine that's up to two and a half times more concentrated than ours, and they can metabolize excess animal protein without destroying their bones. Only herbivores have carbohydrate digesting enzymes in their saliva. Only herbivores have an appendix. It's part of the uh, gastrointestinal uh, immune system. We cannot detoxify preformed vitamin A, but we can detoxify a wide range of plant alkaloids. We can make vitamin A from beta carotene, but we have to have vitamin C, and we can't eat putrefying flesh, and we can ferment fibers. So, in closing, we have abdicated responsibility for our health and that of our children by allowing profit-driven marketing campaigns to dictate how we eat and feed our families. We gorge ourselves on unhealthy foods and stuff our children full of misnamed Happy Meals until they come to resemble pint-sized Michelin men. Then we throw our hands up in despair when they and we develop asthma, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, depression, and other chronic ailments. We have to remember these chronic diseases didn't fall from the sky at the behest of some malevolent god. They are the consequences of our own actions, and as such, we can change our behavior and improve our health. We were all born without preferences. Nobody asked for fried chicken, ice cream, or pork chop in the delivery room. The unhealthy things we eat, we learn to like. And just like we were taught to like unhealthy foods, we can learn to like healthier ones uh, instead. We can change for the better. We must do this not only for our own benefit, but for the health and well-being of our children and for the planet and its other inhabitants. Wow, just in time. <laughs> Ah, uh, all right. I'll, I'll be more than happy to hang out and answer questions outside. I don't want to keep you guys from lunch. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you. <laughs>